Welcome once again to The Spring Online. My name is Matt, I'm the lead pastor here at The Spring, and I'm excited to jump into a new uh, short series of messages with you over the next few weeks. We are going to be talking about how to conquer the world. Uh, so we're gonna take a moment and pray, and we're gonna dive right into today's message, but also just wanna mention, happy Father's Day to all of you fathers out there. Glad you're with us today, and let's take a moment, let's pray, and let's set our hearts and minds on Jesus and prepare for what he has to say to us today. So let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you that we get to gather like this. Thank you for my friends on the other side of this screen. I believe, Lord God, that during these next few moments, you have something you want to say to us. So I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would speak, that you would move in us and stir in us and help us, God, to be more like Jesus. I pray, God, that during these moments, your presence would be felt wherever this service is viewed, wherever this message is viewed. And I pray, God, during these moments that the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth would be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, like I mentioned, today we are going to start a series that I'm calling How to Conquer the World. And it's really just going to be about four parts of this series. And so today is part one. And today uh, we're going to talk about the table that conquers the world. We're going to talk about the table that conquers the world. But first, what are we talking about when we're talking about conquering the world and what is the world? See, being a Christian means being in the world while not being a part of it. This is a phrase that we see kind of pop up and an idea, really, that we see pop up throughout the New Testament, that Christians are this outlier in the world at large, that as we follow Jesus, it makes us somehow different and it makes us somehow stand out. And specifically, if we look at the words of Jesus from the end of John's gospel, he says that we are in the world, but the world rejects us in the same way that the world rejected him because we are not a part of it. So what was Jesus talking about and what are the authors of the New Testament talking about when they repeatedly talk about coming out of the world and not being a part of the world? Well, the world in the mind of those uh, early first century Christians and in the mind of Jesus is a way to sum up the, the culture and the, the practices of the secular world. In other words, it's a way to understand the way that Everyone who is operating outside of the kingdom of Jesus is operating. So you have the kingdom of Jesus, and then you have the kingdom of the world. And so everyone that's in the kingdom of Jesus is supposed to be living by and according to the practices and ideas of Jesus. And everything that doesn't align itself with that kingdom, with the kingdom of Jesus, is what we would call a part of the world. And so as we talk about following Jesus together, what it means is that we are called to follow Jesus Jesus through the world while not being a part of the world, while not participating in the things of the world. So how then are we supposed to conquer the world? What are we supposed to do? If we're not a part of this thing, how are we supposed to overcome it? How are we supposed to know that we can even do it? Because listen, it is hard to be different, isn't it? We live in a day and age when it's especially hard to be different. You express a different idea, you express a different ideology than what the world at large accepts, and you are forced to the side. You're canceled. You're pushed away. And it doesn't matter. Every side is doing it. Everyone is trying to cancel or suppress the other side. And as we follow Jesus, it means not falling into the categories of the world. Instead, falling into a singular, unique category, a category of pilgrims that are passing through. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing I want to mention is don't don't be discouraged by the fact that you have to walk through the world while not being a part of the world. In John 16, 33, Jesus is having the Passover meal with his disciples. He's sitting at a table, really reclining at a table. It's a low table on the floor, and they're eating this sacred Passover meal. And Jesus is kind of giving them his final instructions before they're going to go to the garden where he is betrayed, and then the next day he will be crucified. And so Jesus is giving these kind of closing thoughts to his disciples before his crucifixion, and immediately after this statement that we're going to read from Jesus, he begins to pray for his followers, not just the followers at the table, but everyone that will follow in their example, people like you and me. And in John 16, 33, Jesus says this. He says, I've told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Jesus is giving them peace about what's to come. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart 
because I have overcome the world. Jesus tells us it's not going to be easy. There will be trials. There will be sorrows. When you are in the world, but you are not of the world, you are going to be faced with opposition. But take heart because Jesus has overcome the world. So if we are to follow this line of thinking that Jesus has overcome the world, then there's two things that we need to remember. One, to be in Christ means that we are to be the kind of people that have also overcome the world, that we are living for a larger, grander view of reality. And two, if Jesus was able to overcome the world, then if we follow in his footsteps and practice the kind of life that Jesus would practice if he were living right here today in your body, in your home, then you have the opportunity to also overcome the world. See, we conquer the world by doing what Jesus did. It's our practice. It's the way that we live. Because being a Christian is not just about having right doctrine. The right doctrine will lead to right practice. It is also about having right practice. It's both of those things coming together. We have to have a right set of belief along with having a right set of practices. So what did Jesus do to conquer the world? Well, today we look at the culture that we live in and people keep talking about how broken it is. In the last few weeks here in the United States, we've seen mass shootings, shootings in schools. We've seen tragedy hit so many families because of the violence that's wrought. And, and people are quick to, to suggest political uh, 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 solutions to these problems, right? We're, we're looking for ways to solve them by saying, you know, if we have better gun control or if we have better security on campuses or if we arm the teachers or if we, you know, take away all the guns, whatever side of the aisle you're on, everybody's looking for these political solutions. But there is a much deeper issue at play here. What is it about our culture in America that is producing people that will walk into a, an elementary school and open fire on other people? What is it about our culture that is creating a, a system that, or is creating a situation where we are seeing people vexed with anxiety and depression? What is it about our culture that has created such a broken world? Why aren't we standing back and taking a larger scale view at what's going on in our world? Instead of trying to put political band-aids on situations, why aren't we stepping back and saying, what is the underlying cause? What is the thing that's making us this way? Well, it might be a super simplified answer, but my best understanding of psychology and sociology and specifically of theology comes back to one thing. Culture is formed in the family. It starts there. Family is the foundational place of culture. Family is where we all begin. Family is where we start to learn and know the way to function in the world. It is family that first teaches us how to interact with others. It's family that first forms our opinions about the world. Contrary to what seems to be popular belief, children have to be taught how to become adults. And that's what family does. It shapes and forms us and helps us to become the kind of adults that we want to see in the world. You want to see transformation in the world? Well, it starts in the family. In fact, the place of deepest formation in culture and therefore the place of transformation for culture is the family table. It all starts at the dining room table. There are significant indicators that show us that the simple act of a family sitting down at a dinner table together multiple times a week, no TV on, just sitting down to have a meal together and to talk about the day's events has a significant impact on culture. Today, the average family that does have dinner together, it's about 20 minutes and usually there's a screen on. Back in the early days of the 1900s, the typical family dinner was about an hour and a half long. Families would sit and talk and discuss. It was an opportunity, a place for fathers and mothers to help their children grow in understanding and understand the world that they lived in. It was a place of formation. And if we want to see transformation in our culture, we have to see it start at the family table. It's really simple. It's really simple. It has to start at the family table because we can't form the solution up at the problem. We have to form the solution at the root. How are we raising 
our families. So how do we conquer the world? How do we practice the way of Jesus in the world? It starts at the family table. You see, it's the table where we actually become family. It's through the, the, the act of eating a meal together that there's actually this bond of intimacy that occurs, isn't there? You, you'll have all sorts of interactions with people every single day. You have coworkers that you'll work with, but you won't necessarily invite them over for a meal. And that's not because there's necessarily anything wrong with them or anything wrong with you. It's just because there is something intimate about having somebody over at the family table. The most significant way to impact culture is raising children that love and obey Jesus. And that starts at the family table. You will have many trials in this world, but fear not because Jesus has overcome the world. And so when we gather around the table and we center our lives around Jesus, we can overcome the world. You know, it's interesting, the family table actually takes a really significant role in the life of Scripture and honestly in the life of the Jewish people uh, of which Jesus was one. See, there was a period of time in Jewish history when the people of Israel were driven out of their homeland and into exile. Now, here's the challenge about being driven into exile. Beyond being removed from your home and placed into a foreign land against your will, the, the, the foundational issue for the Jewish people is that their national identity surrounded a temple in Jerusalem where they would worship. And there was a specific practice of worship. There were specific things that they were supposed to do. There were priests and Levites who were in place to help implement the worship of the people. There were sacrifices and altars and, and, and regular rituals that were taking place. And when the people were driven into exile and driven out of their country, they are removed from the temple and they're removed from the opportunity to worship. So what do you do with that? Well, it's fascinating because the Jewish rabbis of the exile period came up with some brilliant solutions to practice their customs and to practice their worship of God while they were incapable of worshiping at the temple. They decided to reevaluate what the temple could be and to reevaluate what the priesthood could be. See, being separated from the temple forced them to reimagine the proper worship of God. So they looked for a new way forward, and it began to look like this. Since they didn't necessarily have access to Levites and priests in a temple, they said, we need a priest for each family. So they placed the father in the role of priest in each family. He became the priest of the household. And by the way, if you've been around the Christian church for much time, especially in America, there's always been a lot of talk about men being the priests of their household. Well, it starts here in ancient Judaism that in that period of exile, the men were expected to become the kind of people that could lead their families in worship. A good priest practices what he preaches. A good priest in the household, a good father, is someone that practices what he preaches. And that's what we have to be. As men leading in our households, we have to take on that role of priest in the household. In the household, the table became the altar. Rather than having a, an altar in Jerusalem where they would take sacrifices and offer them, the family table became the altar. It became the place where, became the, place where the priest would gather the family for worship. The table becomes the altar and ultimately the food becomes the sacrifice, which is not a giant leap from temple worship in Jerusalem because the food, off, because the animals offered in sacrifice on the altars became the food of the priests. And it's the same exact thing happening in the household of those living in exile. This solution is brilliant. It's to say we have a priest in each home, we have an altar in each home, and there's a sacrifice offered. And while they would gather together at the family table prayers would be offered, right? We give thanks for this food. We pray for God's blessing upon it. We pray for what's happening in the household. Praying at mealtime isn't just this little ritual thing that we do, but it is a way for us to remember that we are here to worship God, that our lives are to be centered around the worship of God. And then at the table, fellowship is experienced. The family is brought together. The family is worshiping together. And the family together expresses what it is to follow God. See, the rabbis modeled this table fellowship off of the Jewish Passover. It was a really brilliant solution. They looked at what already existed in their scriptures. A time every year in ancient Israel when the head of the household, the father of a household, would take on the role of priest offering a sacrifice on behalf of the family so that they might experience the worship of God together. They just took that 
annual practice of Passover and turned it into a nightly practice of worship in each and every home. And how beautiful would it be if as Christians we did something similar? We took the family table, the place where culture is formed, and turned it into a place of worship. You see, Jesus, who, by the way, was a recognized rabbi in his day, instituted a new, wor- a new act of worship at the family table. In fact, it was at the Passover table that Jesus institutes this new act of worship. We call it communion. And Jesus, being a rabbi, worshiping with his closest followers at the table of Passover, institutes communion. Paul, another recognized rabbi and an author of so much of the New Testament, explains what Jesus has given to us in the act of worship and communion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 30, it reads like this. It says, I pass on to you what I have received from the Lord himself. So this is Paul saying he is giving to us what he received from Jesus himself. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, the Lord Jesus, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it in pieces and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So take and eat the bread in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. And every time that you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or you drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. And that is why many of you are weak and sick and some have even died. See, Jesus is our high priest. And so Jesus shows us the proper way to worship him. And how does he show us how to worship him? To gather around the table with the bread and the cup. That's how Jesus instructs his people to worship. Because Jesus recognizes that Christians are going to be a people of exile. That we are not the kind of people that are going to have a centralized temple. But instead, we are going to have to look into our homes and find in our homes a place of worship. So he institutes Worship at the table, like a good rabbi would for people in exile. He invites us to worship at the table. He offers up the bread, and he tells us that the bread is his body, which is broken for us. And every time we eat it, we're to to remember him. He tells us that that bread, that bread is his body, that when we consume it, we are taking in ourselves this remembrance of his body broken on our behalf. Because what makes us family but the broken body of Jesus? What binds us together but the broken body of Jesus? He takes the wine after supper and he gives thanks. And he says, this cup is a new covenant written in my own blood. A new arrangement between God and man. Drink it and every time you do, remember Jesus. He sets us down at the table. He gives us his body. He gives us his blood because he is the ultimate high priest. He gives us himself at the table. You see, communion is a reorientation to reality. How do you be in the world and not of the world? You have to remember reality. The world is really good at trying to cloud our vision, and it's really good at trying to to make us think that things should work one way when really the kingdom is supposed to work totally differently. Jesus is the ultimate reality. He is the final word on reality. And when we take communion, we are reorienting our lives to the ultimate reality, that Christ died in our place. The command at communion from Jesus is remember me because he knows we're going to forget. So when we gather to worship, our worship is to remind us of Jesus. Our worship is to remind us that we are not of this world. Instead, we are transformed by Jesus for the purpose of being different in this world. We are living from a different reality and revealing true reality to all of the world when we take communion. The truth of Jesus' sacrifice is what makes us a family. It's what binds us together. It's part of why we call it communion. It is about having community and a commonality and being bound together, us and God. He makes us family at the table. And by the way, it is his brokenness that is mending humanity. 
It is the broken body and shed blood of Christ that puts us all back together. It is his brokenness that heals our brokenness. It is his life poured out that gives us life. When we come to communion, when we come to the table for worship, what we're actually doing is realigning to the reality that God is making all things new. We must honor what we do at the table of communion as sacred. It's not just a little snack that we have in church. It's not just a a little thing that we do as a ritual. No, no. It is a sacred act. Paul instructs in 1 Corinthians that some people taking communion in vain or treating it as something that's, that's lesser causes them to not only get sick but die. This is not just some some random superstition of a New Testament leader. No, this is the instruction that we receive from the apostles. The communion is so sacred that if we take it in a manner that is unbefitting, if we take it in vain, that we could get sick and some have even died from it. So what do we do at communion? Well, we're told to set ourselves right with God, right? We're to, 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 to search in and, and look at our own hearts, but also we have to confess to one another. Jesus gave other instructions about worship. He, he once made the statement that if you're on your way to the altar to offer your sacrifice, and upon arriving at the altar, you remember that you have something against your brother, that you are to go be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your sacrifice. We don't come to this table of communion without practicing the way of Jesus. If I have something against someone else, it is my obligation to make it right before I go to communion. That's what it takes. That's what it takes to worship Jesus. It takes setting everything else aside. It is so countercultural to our world. A world that says, get yours. A world that says, do whatever makes you feel good. We come to the table to worship Jesus remembering that he gave his life so that we could have life, that his brokenness is our mending, that his blood is what makes us who we are. And so as such, we must follow him. What we do at the table matters. The way that we worship Jesus matters. And that's how we conquer the world. We conquer the world by building families at the table that worship Jesus because we recognize that we might be in this world, but we're not of it. Our king is a different kind of king, and his kingdom is a different kind of kingdom, and we are going to live in response to that. Today, maybe you feel like you're far away from this family, the family of Jesus, and maybe you want to come into the family. You can do that. It's as easy as ABC. A, you have to admit. You have to admit that you're a sinner, somebody that's been separated from God by your very nature and by your own rebellion against him. B, you have to believe. You have to believe that Jesus is the one and only one that can save you from your sins. And C, you have to choose. You have to choose to follow Jesus today and every single day. Admit you're a sinner, believe he's a savior, and choose to follow after him. If today you want to do that, I would invite you to pray a simple prayer goes like this. Jesus, I give you my life. Go ahead, right where you're at, pray it out loud. One sentence, Jesus, I give you my life. That one sentence is a confession that that your life is no longer your own, but that it belongs to him. If you prayed it for the first time, do us a favor, drop into the comments, send us a direct message. Let us know because we would love to come alongside of you as you take your next steps in following Jesus. I can't wait for next week to share some more about how we conquer the world. So make sure you tune in. We'll see you next time. 